Hello and welcome to our today's session. Today we are going to be looking at what we refer to as a sequence diagram. We are going to be looking at the components that make up a sequence diagram and then we are going to end up with drawing the sequence diagram. To begin with, a sequence diagram is just but an, inter an interaction diagram. And being an interaction diagram, it shows how processes or activities are carried out and specifically the order in which those particular activities are carried out. In other words, it helps us to know the interactive behavior of a system that a given actor or a user is interacting with. It shows the interaction between the objects and those particular objects operate in a sequential order and that sequential order it's on the basis of how the interactions are taking place you can see in this example where we are having this being the actor and then we are having this being an object so this having being an object we're going to be discussing in a short while what they are but you can see that there is inter an interaction from an actor to the first object then from this first object to the second object and there is also an interaction from this third object back to the second object. So that's what we are saying, that it depicts an interaction between objects. You can see there is an interaction between these two objects. And the interaction happens in a sequential order. You can see that we are having this particular interaction, and then there is a time gap between that activity and that activity. There is another activity. There is also a time gap between activity two and activity three. A full sequence diagram normally looks as shown. We are going to be discussing each of these particular components, but we are going to see that uh, this is one of the components that forms a sequence diagram. It's called an actor. We are going to see what is an actor. This one, it's called an object. It's the same as this one. It's the same as that one. We normally have what you are seeing as dashed lines. We refer to them as lifelines. And we are going to see in a short while what they are. Then you are going to see that we have some solid lines as well as dashed arrows. And you are going to see that these ones are normally referred to as messages. And you are going to see in a short while what they are. Then we have this which you refer to as an alternative frame. And there's something else which you also refer to as a loop frame. We are going to see in a short while what they are. Then lastly, we have this, what we refer to as an activation box. And you can see that there are some activation box that are pretty small. We are going to see the reason. And you can see that there are some that are longer. Why do we need a, a sequence diagram? One, it helps us to document the process. We are able to understand the entire process from the beginning to the end. The other one is that it helps us to identify as well as to understand the requirements that are expected from a particular system. In respect to drawing the sequence diagram, now that we have understood of all the components that make up a sequence diagram, we are going to take a case scenario of an ATM. And in this given case, where you're drawing a sequence diagram, we need to ask ourselves, which system do we have in mind? Which module do we have in mind? So in our case, we are going to have an ATM system in mind. And the case being, that a user goes to an ATM, the ATM interacts with a bank server, and a personal account is accessed. So you can see that we have a user here who accesses an ATM. The ATM links up to a bank server, and from the bank server, we link up to the user's account. Now, in respect to this, the ATM, the bank server, as well as the bank account are all parts of an ATM system, the whole of this, which is going to be an ATM system, and we refer to them as objects. The person who interacts with these particular objects, we refer to them as an actor, and they are normally external to the system. Now, in our case, let's see, when we have such a user who goes to an ATM and they want to do a withdrawal, can we be in a position to draw a sequence diagram for the withdrawal process? In a sequence diagram, we represent an actor using some sticks, as shown below, and an object is represented in form of a rectangle. 
So to draw a sequence diagram for a withdrawal process, then we need to begin by stating the actor and drawing the symbol for the actor, who is the person who is supposed to initiate the withdrawal on the leftmost side, and then followed by the objects in the order in which the interaction is supposed to take place. So we begin with the actor, who is the customer, followed by the ATM, which is the immediate object that the customer interacts with. The ATM links up to the bank server, and from the bank server, we link up to the person's account or to the bank account. So the objects are placed in a sequential order from left to right on the basis of which one uh, begins interaction first. The next component that I want us to look at is what it refers to as a lifeline. Now a lifeline is a vertical dashed arrow, as you can see, that moves from top bottom words, that shows the existing how long does a particular object or actor interact or exist within a given time period. So as we move from top to down shows that time is moving and we are going to see in a short while. So we normally use a dashed arrows to represent the duration or the passage of time as the different objects or actors are interacting. So having set up everything, the next thing that we now need to do is to show how the interaction takes place when we are doing the withdrawal. To do that, we normally use another component which you refer to as a message. So the message is used to show the information that moves between objects or between actors and an object. Now the sequence of the message is shown as we move downwards within the lifeline. And they are normally indicated by what you refer to as a solid line. And of course there is always going to be a time gap between one particular message and the next particular message. The arrow, of course, denotes the direction of that particular message. So a user gets to the ATM and a user inserts the card. So how do we represent that? So from the user inserting the card, we are going to draw a solid line and we are going to type there insert card from the actor to the ATM. So what happens? Once the card is inserted, the next thing is that the bank server needs to validate the card. So we are going to say or to draw another line with a small time gap that moves from the ATM object to the bank server to validate the card. And you can see that arrow that we have drawn that denotes validation of the card. Something happens. When the bank server does the validation, there are two things that are likely to happen. One the verification is going to return a message of either the card is valid or there is another message that can be returned back which says that the card is invalid. When an object returns a message, we refer to that message as being a return or a reply message. Now, every message that is a return or a reply message, it's normally indicated by what we refer to as a dashed line. So all lines are going to be solid lines with the exemption of a reply or a return message which is denoted by a dashed line. So the return message will be the card is okay if we presume that uh, the verifying the card was valid. And in that given case, what we will do is that we need to request the user to enter for the PIN. So what happens is once we verify the card and we realize that the card was correct, then we are going to have a dotted line back which says the card is okay and now a user might be prompted for a pin. You are going to see that uh, the message from the ATM to the actor or to the user is not dashed because it's not a reply to any message. That's why we are denoting it with a solid line. So take note of the sequence of the messages. However, what happens when the card is invalid? And in this given case could be maybe the card is expired or maybe the card belongs to a different bank altogether. So in that given case, we normally use what we refer to as an alternative frame so that we model that scenario. An alternative frame is used when we have a condition uh, where a choice needs to be made between two or more message sequences. Now the choices have to be mutually exclusive implying that one action has to be taken if the condition is true and another condition needs to be taken if the condition is false. So the symbol for representing an alternative frame is as shown. When the condition is valid, it's the topmost part that is executed. When the condition is false, it's the bottom part 
that is executed. So let's see how we can incorporate the alternative frame within our scenario. So we are going to draw an alternative frame above where we are having our card OK and a request pin. So that the upper part, which we are saying that uh, if the card is valid, so we are going to replace this condition with the statement, if the card is valid, then what happens? We need to request for a pin. And so the else part is going to take care of when the card is invalid. So you can see that now we have a better arrangement here that if the card is valid, card is okay, request for a pin. But now we have a, a lower part, which is the else section, which you are going to see that is supposed to take care of when the card is invalid. So how do we represent the invalid part? So we are going to type it within the else section and we are going to say that we are going to state card invalid. And you remember, we are verifying the card. So we are going to have a dashed arrow because it's a response to this one. And we're going to state card invalid and then we eject the card and this process stops at that. However, if the card has been verified and a pin has been requested, then the next thing that is going to happen is a user is going to be prompted to enter the pin. You will recall from this particular diagram when you are dealing with the alternative frame, there was a request to enter the pin. So the arrow from the actor back to the ATM is going to be a dashed simply because it's a response. It's going to be a return message from the ATM. And that's why we are going to have it as dotted. Once the pin is entered, again, what we need to do is we need to have the bank server verify for us whether the pin is correct. So in this given case, we are going to have a solid line that needs to state the verify pin. Of course, we expect that uh, if the pin is found to be okay, the user is going to be prompted to enter the amount that they are supposed to withdraw. However, if the pin is incorrect, what we expect is the bank server needs to, re to return an invalid message and at the same time, it's equally supposed to eject the card once the message is displayed. So to denote that, we use another alternative frame. You can see now we have the first alternative frame. We have another alternative frame. Now this alternative frame is being used to verify the card, the, the pin. So once a pin has been verified, if the pin is okay, you can see it's a dotted line. So visa is going to be requested for the amount. However, if the pin is invalid, the card is going to be ejected. Now in the event the card is injected, the process stops at that. However, if the amount is requested, the process continues. A user is going to be prompted to enter the amount that they want to withdraw. So they have been requested for the amount. And so we are going to have a dashed or a dotted arrow because it's a response to the request that was made for the user to input the amount that they do want to withdraw. So the user is going to be prompted to enter the amount that they want to withdraw. Then the transaction is going to be started. And so the bank account is the one that is actually going to verify for us whether there are sufficient funds in the account. Of course, now we know that the withdrawal of the amount again will be on the basis that uh, there are sufficient funds within the account. So if the funds are sufficient, we expect that the bank server is going to withdraw the amount and uh, the bank account is going to respond with the withdrawal successful back to the bank server. So if there is a verification that the funds are okay, then the amount is actually going to be withdrawn from uh, the bank account. And a response back will be with the withdrawal successful, which is a response Again, transaction successful, which is a response, and then their cash is going to be dispensed over the ATM. However, funds are insufficient. What we expect is that we are going to have a transaction being unsuccessful and the card is going to be ejected. Now, there's something else which you refer to as an activation box. An activation box normally shows how long an object was involved in the performance of a given process. And so we normally draw the, the activation box to denote the duration within which a particular object was involved within the performance of a given process. And as you can see in the diagram below, 
the bank account was only active from this particular point it was dormant for this particular period and the interaction only began when we were verifying whether there are sufficient funds and so we normally draw the activation box from that particular point so where there was no interaction we do not draw the activation box for the two of them atm and bank server because the interaction began right from the top you can see that we have drawn those particular activation box remember they help us to know when a given object is active and when a given object is idle as i conclude there are certain adjustments that i would propose within the diagram that we have just shown so that we're able to to imitate a real scenario we know that in an actual atm scenario when a user forgets the pin we do not eject their card a user is normally given around two attempts or three attempts depending on the bank to re-enter their pin so to achieve such a scenario we normally use now what not a, an alternative frame but what referred to as a loop frame now a loop frame allows the user to enter the pin a couple of times until the given preset condition has been met so for instance in this given case we have given a user a login attempt that should be less than three so in actual sense he has only he or she has only been given two attempts so a user is going to be prompted to enter the pin then the pin is going to be pushed the pin is going to be uh, validated if the pin is uh, invalid we'll keep on rotating around this particular point we'll keep on rotating around this particular point two times now in the event that we realize that uh, and of course these ones remember they are supposed to be dashed this one is equally supposed to be dashed and this one is supposed to be dashed now in the event that uh, the attempts go beyond two so in this given case there are three then what we expect is that the card needs to be locked and you can see the card being locked so we again use an alternative frame but this alternative frame does not have the else part so this is going to take care of when a user decides to re-enter the pin three times the card is actually going to be locked however we expect now if the pin is okay and the pin is okay then uh, the user is going to be prompted to enter the amount that they want to withdraw that request will go all the way to the bank bank account and we can again use an alternative frame in that given case to verify whether the transaction is okay in this particular case what we are trying to do is to confirm whether there are sufficient funds if there are sufficient funds what we need to do is transaction is okay and the transaction is okay however in the event we realize that there are no sufficient funds it's a transaction unsuccessful transaction unsuccessful transaction unsuccessful and we are going to eject the card that is in the event that the amount a user is withdrawing is greater than the account balance thank you and i look forward to seeing you in the next session